We have the pleasure of welcoming John Baldoni today to our interview series Leaders Hum. I'm Aishwarya Jain from the People Hum team. Before we begin, just a quick intro of People Hum. People Hum is an end-to-end, one-view integrated human capital management automation platform. The winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work with AI and automation technologies. We run the People Hum blog and video channel which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year and publish around two interviews with well-known names globally every month. And now for our guest, John is a globally recognized leadership coach who has been transforming workplaces and leaders for more than two decades. He is the best-selling author of 14 books which have been translated to 10 different languages. He has been recognized as one of the most influential experts in leadership training and development by a multitude of organizations worldwide. Bringing with him a huge experience in the field, we are very honored to have him in our interview series. Welcome John, we're thrilled to have you. Thank you Ashwara. I'm very happy to be with you and thank you for that warm introduction. Our pleasure John. So John, you have had a wonderful journey in your career. Can you tell us a little bit about it and share with us some experiences that shaped you to be in this amazing Good place. question. I think it begins with my parents. <laughs> my father was a physician and my mother um, was initially a homemaker but became very active in our community and local politics. And both of my parents were, um, my mother's still living, bless her, and um, our outward direct, they served others. My father is a doctor, my mother as a, uh, as a um, community organizer and doing better things for other people. So that's where my outreach came and uh, I'm walking in their shadow. <laughs> so my education, um, I was uh, went to Georgetown, which is a Jesuit school, and the Jesuits taught me to uh, think critically, or at least they tried to. So uh, I try to do that as much as I can. I began my career um, in corporate communications as a writer, and so I wrote speeches, and I eventually said, hey, I want to be saying on stage. And so I had went back to school and got a master's degree at the University of Michigan, Dearborn, and I've been writing and coaching ever since second career for me that's amazing 40 years of writing and so you know in all of your experience what do you think are the key points that leaders of today should keep in mind while managing their employees especially in this situation you know of a pandemic because the world has shifted to remote right. working and leaders are suddenly confused so what would you advise them that's a very good question and I always I'm always asked about how leadership is evolving. And I actually, in some ways, I don't think that it is. I think the principles, uh, I believe in the concept of servant leadership, where a leader is there to bring people along with him or her. And so those principles are timeless. They have been with us since the beginning of time. What has changed are two things. One is um, more in management and leadership positions, which is good. That broadens the scope of ASIF and uh, have taught us to be. And so I think organizations are moving toward that. It's not simply a matter of diversity. It's inclusion. And inclusion is not just gender, but people who think and act differently, different cultural backgrounds. And each of us brings something different to the party. Now, the other Another thing which has changed, and we're seeing this particularly in the pandemic, is this, the globalism and the rapid and the and the pace of change. All right. So uh, I, a, a friend of mine who's a physician said, you know, if what had happened in Wuhan, China, had happened 40 years ago, it might have been a, a one or two page story, and, you know. But today, what happens in one corner of the world can easily uh, be transform affect another community, particularly if it's a virus. And so that has changed. So what do leaders need to do right now? I think they have to be, um, be there for their people. In other words, be seen, be heard, and be accessible. Do what the organization needs them to do to keep things together. So um, while we can't physically travel, we have to use the medium that we have, simple as a telephone, uh, text, 
and video chat. So I think in some ways, leaders are more accessible right now because we're all kind of united through our technology, if you will. So how much of a role does you know, technology really play in this? Do you think that uh, people are still very, very, now they're kind of forced to use technology. Previously, everything was face to face and they could just solve problems in the office itself. But now leaders are forced to use technology. And do you think that that also can be a hindrance to a leader's group? We as humans are not wired to look at video screens, okay? We crave human contact. We want to see humans and we need the contact of you know, people together. I think that will continue, but I think we will use technology in ways that make our lives easier, which is what technology is all about. So instead of calling everyone together for a meeting, let's just do it as a quick web chat. And it'll, it'll, I think, instead of wasting time, we'll be more to the point and we'll be more specific. So I think we'll integrate this uh, more into what we're talking about. And I think some organizations will find that their employees work better virtually. So they will keep them virtual. And that has to be a mutual decision because a person who wants to go to the office should, if, if that possibility exists, we should allow them to. But if a person wants the flexibility of working virtually, let's let them. And here's my little thing about this. You know, we, use, we do use the term remote workers, remote. I don't like that term. Remote means isolated and off the chart. Let's use the term virtual. And that implies mutuality. It works for you and it works for me. Wow, well, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, you know, yes. it's, it's just not about the term remote. Yeah, I think you're right. And, you know, generally speaking, um, what are the skills that as a leader, you know, a lot of leaders struggle with communication, which is kind of a uh, main aspect of being a leader. I think thinking about this question and getting back to virtual, I think if you're a boss, you have to be more planful. You have to know that at 10 o'clock, I'm going to have a video chat with, um, say, you or my team. So I'm going to think about what I'm going to say before I get on the call. Whereas before, a, a boss might just walk into the meeting and start talking or chat or whatever. Maybe we'll be more planful, and that's good. When I say um, I came up with a little um, uh, little model uh, thing about uh, what speakers leadership communications is um, speaking, listening, and observing, and then acting on it. So we speak our message, that's the planful part, and we listen, 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 and we observe. And the observation is, what am I not seeing? So are people engaged in their work? Do they want to come to work? Um, what are the obstacles? And if I say to you, Anishwara, well, how are things going? And you kind of look down and you go, well, they're fine. And then I ask someone else and he does, says the same thing. I'm knowing I'm not getting the straight truth. Uh, some, they might say everything's okay. And, but I have to look at myself and I'll say, what am I, what kind of symbol, what kind of message am I sending? Am I aloof? Am I, are you afraid of me because I'm your boss? So afraid, I mean, are you, you don't want to tell me the straight truth. And if I'm the boss running our team, running, working in our company, that's a problem, son. That's a problem. So I think by speaking, listening, and observing more planfully, I think we can do a better job. Right. So I think we should uh, plan in advance as to, you know, when, when you kind of want to connect with the team and just schedule a particular time, probably block their calendars and then just talk and communicate on video calls and just get to know the expressions and what they're feeling, how they're feeling. Right. Uh, always read the room. And then how are people reacting? Now, interesting, Ashra, it may, it's harder on video to do that, you know? So that's why we still need this human contact. And we'll get back to that. <laughs> we will. <laughs> when, I don't know, but we will. 
well. We will absolutely. And you know, in all of this, what what about middle managers? You know, what is your advice for middle managers? Because they would also need to be very very effective communicators with all the levels in the organization. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm a big champion of middle management, and because. Um, they're the ones that make things happen. You know, we like to think that the CEO says, do this and everybody does it. Well, it doesn't really work that way. It takes uh, women and men of good heart and good intention to carry forth those directives. And we have something called alignment where everyone is united in cause. And if we have people that say, ah, I don't want to do that or whatever, your alignment falls apart. And we're not acting as one unit. We're not acting for uh, the best way we can. So what you said is important, but um, I like to say that middle managers need to um, think like a CEO and act locally. So what do I mean by that? They think big picture, where's our company going? And they think, how can I fulfill that mission? How does what I do contribute to the whole? That's what's important. Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, in all of this, we also see that the gig economy is rising. There are gig workers for all kinds of jobs. And how do you think the management of an organization is going to change given the circumstance? Well, that's a good question. And I think we've been, you know, um, it's easier for a company to hire gig workers because they don't have to, at least in our country, they don't have to pay them benefits. And so you, they're in a sense, what they are is peace workers. You know, you get, you do 10 things, you get paid for 10 things. You do nine things, you get nine things. You're not on salary. Some people like that flexibility. I worry about the, um, the sustainability of gig workers. They need, they need to have the protections that they have. So why? So they can do their best. If they're worried about their next assignment, they won't be focused enough on what they need to do. So companies have to come to new relationships with them, be more protective. As long as you're producing for me, I'm going to have your back, as if they would for employees. And essentially, they are employees, so they should be treated respectfully. Absolutely. Inclusion is very important nowadays and, you know, you have to be very mindful of all, all sorts of employees that you have and treat them with equality, right? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're talking about uh, the challenges that leaders face. Now, you have worked with several leaders and, you know, you give a talk a lot about it. So, in your experience, what is that one thing that leaders need to change right now? What do you think leaders most often do wrong? I think they need to look at um, uh, employees not as assets, um, not as resources, but as contributors. And when I look at you as a contributor, I'm looking at you as a partner. And a contributor is someone who has the potential to collaborate. And that means no company succeeds without the hearts and minds of its contributors. And when I feel that what I do contributes to what you do, we can collaborate. And your idea and my idea and my way of doing things, it's one and one becomes five, you know, because we're so much stronger when we work together than when we work independently. So. Right, absolutely. And there are also, you know, a lot of times that there are employees that do not match with the culture of the organization or they're not able to achieve goals. And then leaders have to give them feedback and try to improve them. So what is your concept of performance management and measurement of performance? Um, it's a good question. And it's a tough question. And I think... Uh, and I talk about this in my new book called Grace, A Leader's Guide to a Better Us. And I think it begins with respect. And it's, I assume the best in you, Ashwara. And let's say I think that you are underperforming. Rather than going to you and saying, look what you did wrong. and look, Let's sit down and let's have a conversation. Okay. 
tell me about what do you think about the job? What should you be doing? And we talk about it and we align our expectations. You might have expectations for this and I have expectations for that. I am the boss, so I can say, Ashwara, I need you to do these things. And so we have a conversation about it and then we agree to it. So what we're doing is having a coaching conversation. And then I hold you accountable for those expectations. And at the same time, I support you. Are you trained to do what I'm asking you to do? Are, do you have the resources to do what I'm telling you to do? And that's important because if, if you don't have that, you, can't, you might be well-intentioned. You have a good heart, but you can't fulfill it because you don't have the right tools. That's my responsibility. And so if you underperform, I'm responsible for that underperformance. But if, you, if the employee has everything, then he or she may not be the right person and I need to find you another position or we need to go our separate ways. Right. So leaders need to be accountable and they need to uh, take ownership of the behavior of their team members also. And right. And when you mention accountability, accountability begins at the top. You know, I have to be accountable for what I'm responsible for. And if I shirk that, people will sense that immediately. Well, the boss doesn't do what he expects me to do something, but he doesn't uh, fulfill that part of the bargain. So why should I listen to him? So accountability is critical. Yeah. Absolutely. That makes sense. And, you know, at the individual level, um, do you think that leaders should have more emotional intelligence than having, you know, IQ? That's a good question. I think we need both. I mean, you have to have smarts <laughs> to be able to do your job. And smarts will cover up for your fact of lack of emotional quotient, you know, your people skills. And people do get hired because of their smarts but they get promoted because of their EQ, because they get along with people. So you actually need both, you know? And at the same time, you know, if you put me, I know nothing about engineering. So I have good people skills and you could put me on an engineering team and I'd probably make friends with people, but I'd be terrible because I don't know it. At the same time, you could take an engineer with not great people skills put him on an engineering team and coach him to be better, to open up more and be more receptive to feedback with others. So it's that balance. So. Absolutely. Balance. All right. Uh, and that kind of brings me to the last question that I have for you, Joan. Uh, if you have any important sound bites that you think that, are, you know, viewers should know right now, well, it's something I said before, but I've said it uh, many times. I say three things. Be seen, be heard, be there. What do I mean? Okay. Um, be around. Be, okay. Be there. Listen. Be, be, say your message. Be consistent. We talked about being planful, but also listen and listen for what you don't hear. And then be there. What does be there mean? It means everything. It means if you ask your team to work on Saturday, you go in on Saturday. If, if there's a tough job to be done, you work extra hours to do it. Being there also means you recognize good performance. And when you do a good job, I let you know about it and I thank you in public. And I'm transparent about that. I am inclusive with other people. I embrace it. So I do everything that's necessary to make my team work. So be seen, be heard, be there. That's, that's a wonderful message. And that what that implies is that, you know, I think often leaders just think that when they become leaders, you know, their job has been reduced or now they can relax and they can just manage people. But in reality, leaders have to work harder so that the team is motivated and they really need to have more accountability. And that I think is also, you know, a big gap. Absolutely. You are hit the nail on the head. I could not have said it better. Well, thank you so much, John, for joining us. It was a pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate your time and your views. So thank you so much. 
Thank you, Ashwara. You asked great questions and you made it easy for me. So I say thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for your time.